Hello, best ever listeners. Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Ash Patel, and I'm with today's guest, Bikran Sandhu. Bikran is joining us from Scottsdale, Arizona. He is the CFO, COO, and co-founder of Rise 48 Equity, a multifamily syndication company. Bikran is a GP and LP on almost 5,000 units across 26 properties. Bikran, thank you for joining us today, and how are you? Hey, Ash. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks. Happy to be here. It's our pleasure to have you. Bikram, before we get started, can you give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So my background, Ash, um, I've been uh, in, uh, I'm a CPA. I started my career as uh, as an auditor uh, uh, working at PwC, which is one of the big four accounting consulting firms. Um, um, Audited, you know, Fortune 100 companies, and uh, helped uh, you know take a, a company public here and there. So after about four years of doing that, I moved into management consulting. So helping other companies go public, issue debt, place uh, equity, um, buy other companies, uh, you know, sell to subsidiaries. Really kind of cut my teeth on you know pro formas and figuring out how co- uh, businesses are evaluated. And then uh, in about uh, around 2018, um, started looking into real estate and, and multifamily in general and wanted to kind of move into, um, you know, doing something myself when it comes to like acquiring businesses and selling businesses. So um, kind of got the caught the real estate bug at that time, you know, read some books uh, uh, and uh, and started just, you know, pursuing pursuing the whole uh, real estate uh, dream. And you were getting burned out probably, right? A little bit, yeah. (laughs) Man, those companies turn and burn people, and that's uh, right. Yeah, if if you can stand the heat for so many years, you can Mm -hmm. get rewarded way down the road. But good for you. Okay, so you you realize you're just working a lot. Uh, You're probably learning a lot, but you're making other people a lot of money. That's correct. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that was a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you decided real estate looks appealing. What was your first step? Yeah. So at at the very beginning, you know, I didn't know anything about real estate when I was, uh, I had a condo of my own. My mom had her own house um, and she was actually just moving to a new house and she was going to rent out her, her current home. So just almost like forced into being a landlord and she just had the worst experience. Um, She lives in Fresno, uh, California, not very landlord friendly. Uh, So every time, you know, a tenant would move out, they would essentially just destroy the house pretty much. So all her profits for the year just went away at the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, I never wanted to get into single family rentals. I thought, you know, that's too much risk with just one asset, especially when that asset costs, you know, more than a million dollars built in the seventies and you're essentially giving it to a tenant, um, and hoping to God, nothing bad happens. Um, and, uh, so I started doing some analysis here and there, you know, read some books, uh, multifamily millions, rich dad, poor dad, you know, the basics. And um, started putting together, uh, like, essentially uh, uh, our forecast for my wife and I, like, okay, well, if you want to get into real estate, how do we do it? And where do we want to scale up to? So we established goals, uh, we established timelines for ourselves, and um, ultimately, you know, uh, we met Zach Happenstall and Robert Shefchik, who are the co-founders of Rise 48 Equity, alongside myself. And uh, just kind of went to town, uh, you know, we quit our day jobs. Uh, I wasn't do I was doing multifamily alongside just being a W-2 worker at another firm uh, for a while. But then in uh, April of 2021, decided, hey, you know, we're young. Uh, if we need to make mistakes, we can make them now. And then uh, just went full time into real estate and just started uh, working full time into buying deals. Vikran, explain to me what it means when you said I was doing multifamily as a W-2. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I was at uh, my management consulting firm, like during the day, I was doing, um, you know, work for my company uh, that um, that was uh, helping other companies, you know, uh, uh, go public or, or buy other companies or sell divisions. And then at 5pm every day, I would come home and open up my real estate computer and then just go in and start analyzing deals or underwriting them. And then I'll probably work until like midnight, maybe even 1am just trying to get stuff done. So um, I think I did that for about 12 to 13 months. And I figured, you know, it's, um, I had enough savings at the time where I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to dive into real estate, might as well do it full time. Um, so that's when we kind of established Rise 48 Equity. 
Um, I'm, I'm an employee under Rise 40 Equity as well as a co-founder as an S Corp. Um, and uh, so I handle all of the you know, operational and, and financial duties in, in, in the company. Um, so I'm a W2 under the company, but I'm also a, a company owner as well. So I have a vested interest, you know, making sure the company does really well. COO and CFO. So you handle all the operations and all of the finances. What do your partners do? Yeah, so Zach is, uh, he's a CEO of the company. He is uh, primarily uh, involved with, you know, capital formation and then uh, deal sourcing. Um, so he, you know, has built a, a good rapport with all of the major brokers in the uh, Phoenix uh, MSA. So whenever we have a deal that comes, either comes to market or is, you know, going to get traded uh, off market, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you we're going to be one of the first groups to see it. Uh, and we essentially get like a, um, a leg up against, you know, other buyers because, you know, Zach constantly stays in front of these brokers. So um, Zach is focused on deal sourcing and on the capital formation side, um, he's ensuring, you know, we're partnering with the right people to, to buy these deals, the right LPs, right, uh, you know, um, broker dealers, if we work with them. Um, so we're, I, I help out a little bit on that end, but I'm mostly underwriting, making sure that deals are, you know, are going to hit our investor metrics that we're aiming for. Uh, but he's primarily kind of guiding the ship, so to speak. And then Robert Shevchik, he's a chief uh, construction officer. Um, so he's making sure that our large CapEx projects, you know, like exterior paint or rebranding or um, putting in amenities and even doing in, in, even the interior CapEx, you know, the unit interior renovations, everything is on site, you know, getting done on budget on time. So he's kind of overseeing asset management from a construction point of view um, when we buy these deals. Vikrant, did you guys put together this partnership in this company preemptively, or did you start doing deals together and then it just naturally came together? Yeah, yeah, it was the latter there. So uh, we we bought about, I think, six deals before we actually formed Rise 40 at Equity. Um, and, you know, in real estate, especially in multifamily, it's not a single man show. Uh, I could not do everything I do alongside Zach and Robert and try to take it all in house. We would not be where we are today if I was just trying to do it myself. Um, but, uh, you know, we met Zach and Robert in um, early 2019 and we bought our first deal together. We didn't have any LPs in it. It was all our cash. And uh, we really just kind of learned, you know, from the ground up on how to do value at multifamily. Um, we did a couple more deals after that together and kind of figured out, you know, our roles and responsibilities. And, you know, Zach, Robert and I complement each other perfectly. Um, Zach is great being, you know, out there in the field and, and getting our name out there. I, I suck at that. I'm an introvert. Uh, so I like sitting in front of the computer and getting stuff done there. And then, uh, you know, Robert is great at going on sites and knowing what needs to be done from, from an actual operations perspective, as opposed to a financial perspective. So we, we fill each other out very well. And um, I think in, in early 2020, we decided to just formally, you know, uh, partner up together and, and found Rise 40, Rise 40 at Equity. Um, Primarily because, you know, we were, we, we didn't want to send out like different branding messages every single time. Um, like Zach had his own uh, ZH multifamily. I had my bride investors and then Robert had his own uh, company as well. So we just decided, hey, let's just come together. We're going to buy deals together. We're going to do great. Let's just make it easy for the investors as well. Where did the name come from? Yeah, so 48 is because Arizona is the 48th state in the nation, uh, formerly uh, inducted into this 48th state. And I think there's a thing about state 48 that kind of goes wrong in Arizona. So we just said, you know, rise 48 kind of, kind of goes, goes along really well. Got it. Big run. So in forming your company, it just naturally came together because you had experience working with your partners on a number of deals. I've done both where I've sat down, kind of had people lay out a company formation and it never takes off. Right. Um, or I've just naturally started working with people and all of a sudden we form an entity and do more deals and oh my God, it's incredible. What are your thoughts on that overall? Should people sit down in front of a whiteboard and determine their company and the structure and the roles, or should they just start doing deals together and working together? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if you look at like the startup landscapes, right? Like look at all these tech companies that start up and look at all these other companies that go on you don't see, you know, the CEO and the CFO come together, put together a company chart and then launch a company. It's almost always like, okay, we're going to build a great product or provide a great service and we'll build a company along the way. 
So um, I, I read this book called The E Myth, uh, and in there, you know, once you have a company starting uh, started to get going, you're going to go through a lot of growing pains. Um, you're going to have to figure out that hey, you actually now need an HR manager because you have 30 plus employees and they, they need benefits information and all that. So uh, what we what Zach and I did, Zach Robert and I did was uh, we looked at the company. You know, after we had started it, and you know, after we started getting some admin uh, um, task put on us. We put together like an org chart where we just kind of filled out like, hey, we need a CFO who's great for that. That's Vikram. We need a CEO who's good at that. Who's a good chief investment officer. That's Zach, right? That's that. So we started putting our names everywhere. And uh, after that org chart was built out, we started hiring for that org chart. So we needed an acquisitions manager. We hired our acquisitions manager. So, that, so Zach and I kind of got out of that role and started good, doing more uh, revenue generating uh, activities as opposed to company building activities. So I think it's going to, uh, but back to your question, it's most more of you're going to have to experiment with who you, you have chemistry with, I feel like, before you come together and incorporate a business and start working together because everyone's going to say, you know, at the beginning, oh yeah, we're a perfect match. Like there's nothing that could go wrong. And then two months later, you can't stand the other person. Right. So um, it's a dating game for a partnership. So once you are working together, I think that's when you start building the company is probably the, the better way to go. Yeah. That is great advice. Thank you for that. What were some of the growing pains that you guys had to overcome early on? Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest things was, you know, we're all local in Phoenix. So we we're, about 40 minutes to 45 minutes away from all our assets. So we can easily travel out there. Um, the first thing that we had done was we hired a uh, our, our director of asset management, who's our, our VP of operations, Kaylee Chris. Uh, Kaylee was our regional with our pro third party property management company when we used to work with them. And, um, you know, we, we could keep tabs on it day to day, but driving everywhere, making sure all the construction was happening, making sure our budgets were being met, was just taking too much time out of our own time uh, to find new deals. So that's the first person that we hired was someone to kind of oversee our operations. So Kaylee, you know, she does a great job. Uh, meeting with the vendors, uh, getting our DD done, making sure we have bids ready to go the day we close escrow so that we have a timeline established on how we need to renovate, what we need to renovate. Um, and then the second person that we hired was, you know, Brady, who was our transactions uh, uh, associate at the time and now acquisitions manager. Um, and, and as you know, Ash, like there's a ton of paperwork that goes into buying a deal. It's not just like a simple signature and you're good to go on a PSA. Um, there's a lot of lender requirements, uh, escrow requirements, um, and uh, you need to make sure you do your due diligence. So having someone to kind of do the back end, um, you know, acquisition activity really kind of freed up Zach as well. So we were able to kind of focus more on buying more deals. So I think those are the first key hires that we had that really kind of helped us out kind of grow substantially. But now we're just kind of focused on, you know, building out the team, building out the back office and making sure no one's, you know, over capacity and burning out essentially. And how much pain do you undergo before you hire somebody? So when you hired your acquisitions person, were you guys just inundated and overwhelmed? Or was it one of those things where, hey, listen, I don't like doing that. Let's just hire that out. No, I mean, we, our philosophy is, you know, we want to be experts in every aspect of the business, whether it's Zach being an expert in, you know, getting the DD done or me being an expert in the underwriting phase. Uh, but we're not going to just hire someone out and expect them to do something that we don't know how to do. Um, so we, you know, we want to make sure we're experts. And then when we hire someone out, that person has appropriate training to do what we do naturally. So um, it, it was, you know, at a point where, say, Zach was working to like one or two 2 a.m. getting lender docs out uh, and getting all the deals uh, closed, essentially. And at that point, we decided, OK, well, Zach, you need to focus more on, um, you know, finding more deals, not so much closing the current ones because it's just now paperwork. So that's where, you know, we hired our transactions associate at the time where his responsibility was to make sure the deals like the paperwork or the admin on the back end is getting done. But it wasn't so much Zach doesn't want to do it and we're just going to hire somebody. It's more of, OK, I've, Zach knows how to do it. He's an expert in it. He's trained the person and now he can easily, you know, comfortably trust the transaction associate to do his job and, and focus more on other activities. That's a great philosophy. All right. 5,000 units across 26 properties. Mm -hmm. Geographically, where are those? Yeah, they're all in the Phoenix MSA. So we're focused there primarily. All right. Wait a minute. So Phoenix uh, is overheated. 
It's hard to find deals in Phoenix. There's no good deals. The cap rates are too low. Help me overcome a lot of these objections that people have. Yeah, of course. So, so Phoenix, a lot of people don't know this, but Phoenix is the fifth largest MSA in the nation. Um, and there's over 4 million people in here. Um, there's over 400,000 units, multifamily units in the, in, in the Phoenix MSA. Uh, as you mentioned, we've acquired about 5,000 units in total. Um, so we're barely over 1% there in, in terms of total absorption uh, on, on Rise 48 equity side. Um, it, it is definitely very competitive. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that as well. You know, we're competing against, um, uh, we typically buy, you know, deals between 50 to 150 million. Um, and we're primarily competing against, you know, hedge funds, uh, private equity, institutional equity, um, like BlackRock or Tides Equities um, and KKR, et cetera. Um, but um, it, it's definitely very competitive. So, you know, kind of staying in front of the broker, kind of showcasing your, um, your ability to close these deals is extremely important. So every deal we've ever gotten under contract, we've closed it, we've never had any issues. Uh, we've never retraded any, any of the sellers. So we have a very good rapport with the broker. So whenever a deal comes online, um, you know, that relationship aspect really kind of kicks into gear because um, when, when a deal is available for sale, um, we're essentially one of the first ones to see it. And it takes time. Um, uh, I think the first deal that we syndicated, um, like I had underwritten about 70 deals uh, before that first one actually came across. And a lot of the deals are just going to be like way off. You're never going to even get close to the purchase price. Um, and someone's going to buy it for that purchase price. You're going to look at yourself and like, wait, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> so, um, you know, whenever those key moments come up where, you know, we can get to a reasonable purchase price and, uh, you know, we can deploy the activity or the equity for it, um, we pursue it hard. So, well, you know, we'll go um, hard day one for earnest money that we need to, need to put up. Um, we'll make sure we do our due diligence on the front end. So we'll contact our trusted vendors, you know, for HVACs, um, um, uh, the, uh, you know, exterior plumbing, um, the refinishing, just kind of get our budget in order before we actually go on site. So when we go on site, it's more of just a truing up of our, you know, budget to, for the contingencies. It's not so much we go into a deal and, and then figure out, oh no, you know, we didn't budget for this, what happened? So it takes a lot of due diligence on the front end and takes a lot of, um, uh, you know, relationship building uh, to make sure you can take a deal down. And Big Rock, competing against institutions, um, are they just more difficult to deal with as a seller? And I love what you said. You've never retraded a deal, which best ever listeners just basically means you never went in at one price and try to get it lower later. Mm -hmm. And you've never not closed on a deal that you had under contract. Right. Two amazing attributes that I think very few people can hold. Right. Um, and it, it, so is that what gives you the edge against these big institutions that have unlimited capital capital? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think our track record really speaks for us uh, when it, when we go in an offer, because um, it, you have to understand, you know, these institutional capital, they're going to write a check for 40, 50 million dollars and buy a deal that there's just one check and no one has to worry about anything else. The problem is there's a lot of processes in place that they have to go through to write that check. It's not so simple as, you know, one person touring the deal and that person's a decision maker. So our, you know, the edge that we have is, you know, we're syndicating everything. So our investors are investing with us and we're going out and, and deploying that capital. Um, but uh, with that comes, you know, the control that we have. So Zach, Robert, and I are essentially the people that need to sign off on the deal. Whereas for institutional or private equity, they'll have like an acquisition manager come out, tour the deal, underwrite it, say it works, they'll offer on it, but then, and someone else from that um, institutional side needs to come out and, and, you know, look at the deal as well. The decision maker needs to still come out. So when we, you know, have these seller interviews that we have to go on, we essentially tell them like, yeah, you know, we are syndicators. We're raising money from uh, uh, retail investors, you know, high W2 earners, high net worth investors. We do not have private equity, uh, which, you know, kind of goes against us uh, because they want someone who has 100% surety of close, not so much, okay, we well, need to go raise your money. Are you going to close or not? Um, but um, it's, uh, it really helps us out, you know, with the track record. But then the thing that really kind of sells them is, hey, you know what, we underwrote the deal, we are the decision makers, and we're going to move forward, and we've never uh, not closed a deal. So you don't have to worry about some New York hedge fund guy coming out and looking at the deal after they get under contract. We're going to go hard day one with our earnest money, so you know we're going to close. 
Um, and uh, that really kind of sells, you know, our company to, to the sellers. What kind of information do you have access to before you put your earnest money down? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, from a deal perspective, you know, we're looking at all the financials that the brokers are providing. Uh, we do a rental comp study for all the deals as well. So our, our asset management team, um, they essentially go out there, you know, we'll send them like, hey, we're looking at this deal. What type of pro forma rents do you think we can get? So they'll run a co-star report and a real page report for all the comparable properties in that area. And we're primarily looking at properties that have renovated units, because that's really where our business plan kind of aims at. So they'll put together a rental comp study, kind of determine what the pro forma rents are. We'll secret shop these, uh, we'll secret shop these uh, you know, comps to like we're visiting them. We're looking at, you know, what type of amenities they have, what type of uh, other, other kind of um, income that they uh, might charge, like washer dryer upcharge or, you know, pet fees, et cetera. Um, and, and we'll build that all into our, into our model. Um, so we know, you know, going in from a financial perspective, uh, these are the rents we can achieve. Um, and this is the total, um, you know, cost it's going to take us to uh, upgrade the interiors and, uh, and renovate the asset. Um, and then from a contingency perspective, uh, you know, we talk to our vendors, we say, hey, we're buying this deal. It was built in the 80s. Uh, the broker told us around 40% of the HVACs are, you know, um, replaced, uh, the 60% have not. In your estimate, how much do you think it's going to cost to essentially, over the next five years, replace these HVACs and, and get us in a good, good place? And they'll give us bids, you know, just kind of like a verbal bid. And then we'll underwrite that in into our deal so that we know going in, if our CapEx budget is, say, $5 million for a deal, after DD, it comes out to maybe five and a half. It'll range between four and a half to five and a half. So we're never you know, going into a deal with a CapEx budget of, say, $2 million and then coming out at $10 million. Um, we, we have it very well dialed in because we know that earnest money, like we'll lose it essentially if we can't, uh, uh, can't perform. So you have access to a tremendous amount of information before your offer is put in and your earnest money is hard. Right. Are there any kickouts where you can get your earnest money back? Yeah, yeah, there are. There's not, there's a standard language, you know, if the, if the phase one comes back, you know, not clean or like the, um, there's some sort of a zoning issue uh, where, uh, you know, title can't uh, put an exception around it, we'll get our earnest money back for those reasons. But when it comes to, you know, due diligence, uh, we have to make sure that we're comfortable going in. Uh, we, we can't kick out, you know, if, if like say the chiller is going to go down, um, we have to make sure we ask our questions on the front end uh, instead of waiting until DD comes back um, uh, before we do that. Yeah. Interesting. So I am a non-residential commercial investor. Mm -hmm. And in our world, we just make offers and then we get access to a lot of the information. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all the due diligence is in the back end. There's never, ever hard earnest money on day one. Right. It's usually 45, 60 days out. So thank you for explaining that to me. And now I understand yeah, that you have a tremendous amount of information to make an educated offer. Uh, in terms of lenders, well, you know, I want to ask another question first. Yeah. Uh, right now, there's a lot of institutions buying. When you're buying 50, $100 million apartment buildings, are you buying from individuals or institutions right now? Yeah, that's a that's a great question as well. So it's it's kind of a mix, right? So when it, when uh, we buy from an institutional capital or institutional companies like you know True America or Benedict Canyon Equities, uh, we have to really sell ourselves, uh, you know, because we're not institutional and they need to get comfortable with us. Uh, we do buy from, you know, uh, individuals who bought the assets back in like 2000, 2005. Uh, they're not really aware of where the market's at. So uh, we don't have to sell as hard to them. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, we're buying from a mix of, you know, institutional, private equity, um, you know, mom and pop. And then you're also buying from syndicators as well, you know, who are essentially doing what we're doing. But then we can make the deal work better, you know, under our model versus them. Is it hard to get a good price from an institutional seller? Um, it's, uh, <laughs> sometimes it is. Yeah. So, you know, you almost have to, uh, make sure you're offering the right price. And, you know, we have our underwriting model that, you know, I've developed internally looking at other models and kind of back testing it. And, um, I don't, I don't deviate from that model very significantly. You know, if we need to push up the purchase price a little bit here and there, there's some wiggle room that levers I can pull, you know, to make it move. 
But, you know, if you're asking for like a 10% or a 20% increase in purchase price, that's not going to happen. So we've lost, I would say like 90, 95% of the deals we pursue. And some of them, you know, we've lost by maybe only like a hundred thousand or $200,000 on like a 20, 30, $40 million purchase price. And it's just, you can't make the number work. So it's not going to happen. Interesting. And you know that you're a hundred thousand dollars away from getting the deal done. Yeah. Yeah. No, we find yeah. out on the back end because so Arizona. So, like so, so you don't have an opportunity to come back to the table with an extra hundred. You find out much later. Yeah. Yeah. Got so it, sometimes okay. the, the broker would tell us, you know, that, Hey, they're going to sell it for the X amount. And so, and Arizona is like an open um, dis- or disclosure state. So when the deals do close, we know exactly what it's sold for. So we can compare it to our underwriting and where we got to essentially. So we'll find out one way or another. In your value add prospect is basically getting rents closer to market because you look for already renovated units. Is that correct? Um, sometimes. So we'll, we'll make sure that the units or the properties we're going after already have some units that are renovated so that we know that the market rent is achievable. Um, sometimes, you know, the units are hundred percent classic. Uh, the, the owner has owned it for 20, 30, 40 years, hasn't done anything major to it. So, uh, those are, those require a significant bump in, in rents. And, you know, we, we make sure we get them. We've renovated over 565 units to date. And, um, and we've either uh, achieved or exceeded our pro forma rents on every single one of those units. So we have a very thorough understanding of where the rents need to go. Um, so they're either already being achieved, but we essentially have to do the renovations or continue renovations um, at the site to, to get the market rents. Got it. And I want to ask you a question, but I want any best ever listener out there that's driving to kind of brace yourself for this. But Bikram, what kind of cap rates are you buying right now? <laughs> um, you know, if you asked me about six months ago, it was around two and a half to three cap. Um, it has come up a little bit. So between three to three and a half cap, uh, it really kind of depends, you know, what value at how much value at there is uh, from a stabilized perspective. I can tell you that, you know, in year one, we'll get to around six, uh, five and a half to six cap after we uh, essentially implement a more, uh, a better operational strategy, but going in caps are a little, a little tough. <laughs> Two and a half percent cap yeah. rate. Your loan is at three, three and a half. I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how soon can you start paying investors? Yeah, that's a great question. So in our underwriting, you know, we don't leverage the deals up to eighty percent LTC. You know, we'll pair back the leverage because we know we're in a negative uh, uh, leverage there. So our deals are primarily between sixty to seventy percent leverage, uh, more closer to sixty sometimes. And uh, we'll raise up some reserves on the front end as well. Uh, so when we start going out to investors, we'll tell them, you know, on the front end, uh, we want to make sure that the asset is onboarded correctly. We haven't, you know, identified any operational issues that'll uh, that'll need some reserves. But if we don't need anything, you know, we'll start paying out investors within 90 days uh, of of takeover. And we'll, you know, most of that take mo- most of that uh, distribution sometimes made up of um, operational reserves that we're letting go of because we don't need it. But we want to make sure the property is cash flow positive. There's no major issues before we start doing that. So we don't never had those issues. Yeah. And what are the typical returns to your investors? Yeah. So we tell every investor, you know, we underwrite on a five-year horizon. Uh, we do not. Uh, ex- we, you should not have an expectation that we're going to sell within the next twelve to eighteen months. Uh, and in that five-year horizon, we want to try to get you at least to a two X equity multiple. Um, you'll have lower cash flow because these are our value add deals. So the first, you know, couple of years, you'll have maybe three and a half to four and a half percent cash flow on average. Um, but uh, as we, you know, stabilize the asset, uh, that cash flow increases. And uh, overall, you know, we want to get out, get out of the deal as fast as possible. So um, of the 34 assets that we've acquired, we've sold 10 of those assets. Um, and uh, all of them have uh, exceeded our, you know, expectations from an investor level. Um, they've, uh, um, uh, I think our average hold period is about 18 months. And uh, we've had uh, essentially doubled or more all the investor capital at that point uh, in those 18 months. But we tell investors past performance is not indicative of future performance. So temper expectations, five-year holds. And then do you have an issue where investors are saying, hey, look, I'm getting a 7 8% pref over there. Mm-hmm. How are you guys only going to give me 4% for a couple of years? 
Yeah, yeah. No, we have investors who ask that question. And, and it's, it's really, uh, you know, it depends on which market you're in, right? So if you're in the Midwest, where you don't have as much explosive growth as you might have in Phoenix, which, you know, in the past, I think last year was the fifth uh, largest uh, MSA. And in, in, in terms of growth, I think has more than 80,000 people move here. I think that was the fourth largest or fastest growing uh, city. Um, in those Midwest markets, you're going to have higher cash flow because there's not a huge bump on the back end when you sell the deal. Um, in Phoenix, uh, you know, it's more of a value add st uh, strategy because when you do add value, your taxes are not increasing or staying in line with the increase on your on your revenue side. So when we sell, we can actually get a bigger pop when we sell the deal. So um, our operational expense ratio is closer to like 35, 40%. And then, you know, three years down the road, it might be closer to 30% because our revenue is just significantly outpacing our expenses. Um, whereas in the Midwest, you know, you'll have uh, taxes to get revalued. So your income goes up by 20%, your taxes might go up by 20%. So it keeps that OPEX ratio around the same level. So you can't get that huge, you know, growth on the back end uh, when, you, when you sell the deal. All right, Bikram, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Yep. Now, Phoenix, there's people, you know, I've forgotten how many thousands of people move there every day, how many new jobs there is, and everything's in its favor. What happens if that spigot turns off? Have you done any modeling to where if rents don't go up anymore, interest yep. rates climb significantly, there are significant job losses? What does that do when you're on razor thin margins initially? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, yeah, on the on the interest, uh, sorry, on the rental growth. So, uh, Phoenix in the past decade has grown about five to six percent per year in rental growth. That's annual six percent growth in in rental uh, income, uh, or the market rents, I should say. Uh, and that's from RealPage. You know, that's data that we pulled and, and analyzed. Um, and then over the past couple of years, uh, rents have gone up by around 20 to 26 percent uh, for both years, essentially. So on a T12 basis, we've seen significant rental growth. In our model, we assume a stabilized rental growth of about 4 percent in the model. So coming from 20 percent down to 4 percent is a significant downturn in, in, in and of itself. And it's much less than inflation. Inflation, I think, last uh, last month was around 8.6%. So we're assuming, you know, a rental growth of less than half that in our in our model, which is really not feasible. But uh, you know, that's that's how we go out and, and stabilize the rents. Interest rate side, um, yeah, I you know there's a lot of talk about you know rents rates going up, and the, and we've seen it go up significantly. We're typically modeling in about 100 to 150 basis point increase in, in interest rates in the first couple of years of, of us holding the deal. So if we're going into a deal with say a 4% interest rate, we're assuming by the end of year two, our interest rates now at five and a half percent. So we're making sure that we're building that into our model. And then we also buy interest rate caps. So if it does go above, you know, what we expect, we have that back end protection and we pay significantly for some of these caps. So, um, you know, we, we make sure we build in that surety on the back end. And if, you know, let's say there are job losses tomorrow, there's, you know, population increases, are, are declining. Um, well, you need to understand like the Phoenix landscape as well, right? So Phoenix is, you know, there's more than 80 to 100,000 people moving here every single year for the past five years. This is the first year where they're building a lot of units and they're building around 33,000 units this, this year. And um, you can imagine, you know, with all these households moving here, that there's just not enough supply to go around to kind of absorb all these uh, new new people moving out here, with the uh, you know um, house pricing going where it's going, um, it's it's just getting harder and harder to buy a house. So we're we're becoming essentially a renter nation in in this in this country, and uh, with with just not enough supply, I think we're very well insulated against a significant downturn. Um, I don't see rents declining over time. I think there, you know, they, you might have places where you have to do concessions in rougher areas just to get, uh, uh, you know, tenants to move in. But uh, I think rental growth is, is going to slow down. It has to, you can't have a 20% increase every year. It's going to, you're going to run to an affordability crisis, but um, from a, you know, from a downturn perspective, I think Phoenix is very well insulated. Uh, there's a diversity of job growth here. It's not all, you know, focused on say construction, which got hit really hard in 07, 08. Uh, I think at that time, Phoenix was 20% in construction. Now it's close to five to 10%. Um, so it's a diverse job economy and, and it really helps. 
Yeah, even with all the positives, you're still underwriting quite conservatively. Mm-hmm. Bikram, what is your best real estate investing advice ever? Yeah, uh, I would say, you know, perseverance is, is key. You're not going to go into, you know, we don't live in the 80s anymore where we can just offer on a deal and it's a 10 cap and you're going to buy it and it's going to be great, no issues. Um, you're going to have, you're going to underwrite a lot of deals. You're going to find the deals that really work and you have to pursue those aggressively and you're going to lose a lot of those deals. So just pres- persevering and, and making sure that, uh, you know, are sticking to your guns and, and making sure you're underwriting, uh, conservatively, you're going to win the right deal. You just have to persevere and, and, and make sure you get through that. Bikran, are you ready for the best ever lightning round? Yeah. Hit me. All right. What's the best ever book you recently read? Um, I would say uh, the E-Myth is really good. Uh, that really helps us, you know, kind of build our company. Um, the other one that I really liked was Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, it, he talks a lot about uh, kind of putting habits in place, but not trying to go from like A to Z, but taking like little steps here and then watching over the next six to 12 months, how you can get to A to Z slowly. What's the best ever way you like to give back? Yeah, so I think on our end, you know, obviously we we donate to a lot of charities on our end. You know, we want to make sure we support Phoenix as a whole and as as well as you know the country as a whole. Um, one thing that I do personally is uh, we we do try to empower our staff a lot. So you know, we're hiring employees. Uh, some of them are very young; they're kind of starting their career. So you want to make sure that you know they're being empowered and they're growing professionally. So we try to you know let them make some key decisions, kind of help them understand the rights and wrongs. So we're trying to uh, build up our company um, very, you know, efficiently, and we're trying to m- do it so that we're not, you know, micromanaging everybody. We're more just kind of letting people make their mistakes and learn from those mistakes uh, on their end. And Bikran, how can the best ever listeners reach out to you? Yeah, so you can visit us at uh, www.rise48equity.com. Um, that's, you know, our, our company website to learn more about us. My email uh, is bikron at rise48equity.com. So feel free to reach out, you know, set up a call. Happy to talk about uh, our journey and, and how you can, you know, uh, partner with us. Bikron, I got to thank you for sharing your time with us today, telling us about your journey from going from a CPA, working for uh, Pricewaterhouse, probably working hundreds of hours. Yep. <laughs> and finding real estate, growing an incredible company, and giving us a lot of insights into the institutional quality multifamily assets. So again, thank you for your time today. Yeah, of course. No, thanks, Ash. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Best ever listeners, thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share the podcast with someone you think can benefit from it. Also, follow, subscribe, and have a best ever day. 